What's going on, everybody? It's that time again. It's a Sooners Illustrated podcast, episode 38 on this Thursday, November 30th, 2023. Josh Calloway, Tom Green, Colin Kennedy, James E. Jackson will be along in just a little bit. Pack show for you guys on a Thursday. Oklahoma made an OC hire, two hires technically. We're going to talk about that, obviously, at length here in just a second. Great start for hoops. Transfer portal season is kicked up, and Oklahoma is getting kind of jobbed in the CFP rankings. We're talking about it all right here for you on the Sooners Illustrated podcast. But, gentlemen, obviously, we start with the co-OC hires. Colin and I talked about it on Sunday, the emergency reaction show. Jeff Levy leaves. He goes to Mississippi State. We all kind of thought the favorite here, very obviously, was Seth Luttrell to promote from within. That's what they do. They give him the co-OC tag with Joe John Finley, who's still going to come tight ends, obviously, but now gets that co-OC title to go along with it. Guys, talk about just the reaction to it. What you think of the move? Do you like Oklahoma Prodi from within? Do you think they should have went outside the hire? Just kind of absorb it all and just your initial reaction to, uh, you know, the move for Oklahoma. Do you like it? Do you hate it? What do you make of it here? Uh, Tom, you can start. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a very logical hire. Um, It's not the sexiest hire on paper and, you know, Brent Venables even kind of alluded to that himself. It's like, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was the easy decision, but it was also probably the right decision. I mean, we all kind of figured this was going to happen. Like, this is why you bring in a guy like Seth Luttrell after he gets fired at North Texas, because you know that Jeff Levy wasn't going to be around forever. Like, he he was always destined to get a head coaching job at some opportunity. Um, so to have a guy like Seth Luttrell who you could bring in and kind of familiarize with, you know, your personnel – how you kind of run things as a program, as a first-time head coach like Brent is, and to you know basically have him as like a offensive coordinator in waiting without actually saying it, you know it, it should make for a very seamless transition, um, lots of continuity on staff, which they have to like, especially as they make the move to the SEC. You know, not changing things up a whole lot, um, but all, overall, I think this is a really good hire. Um, you know, like we said, we figured that this was going to be the case. You know, there's a reason why we had him at the top of our hot board from the jump. Um, but yeah, just a smart move by Brent Venables. You know, I know some people are, you know, like, oh, Oklahoma can do better. You know, it's, you know, the Oklahoma OC job is one of the top assistant jobs in the country. They can get whoever they want, basically. Well, this is who they wanted. It's not like they had to settle this. They got who they wanted. And I think when you analyze this too, again, we had both of these names mentioned directly in the reaction podcast on Sunday, Josh. I look at this and I say, to me, I think sometimes we get caught up exactly in what Tom is talking about, going out and getting the big name because you're Oklahoma, you're an SEC program now, this, that, and the other. And as we know, the track record of Oklahoma offensive coordinators typically go on to be head coaches elsewhere. But I look at this and I say, sometimes we forget the art of allowing people to move up within organizations that not only mean a lot to them, but that they've put a lot into. And I think when you look at not only Seth Luttrell, But Joe John Finley, that's the case for both. I mean, obviously, they're both former players. They're alumni of the football program. Both were standouts during their time in Norman, and they had always wanted to come back. And Joe John Finley has been a big part of this staff for a long time, even dating back to the Riley tenure. Seth Luttrell, again, incredibly calculated move by Brent Venables to bring him in. And I think people forget there were a lot of Power 5 programs that wanted that guy as an offensive coordinator shortly after his tenure at North Texas. But the way things fell, some of the puzzle pieces couldn't fit together. He ends up taking a gig back at the place he likes to call home. And eventually all things work out well for those who dedicate themselves to something greater than themselves. And I think that's the case again here for these two individuals. And I think that they've earned it. I think, yes, it's easy to get caught up in the the Sean Lewis's, right, who we reported at Sooners Illustrated, had been rumored to be interested in the position. It's easy to get caught up in the Brendan Marians, who Tom and I had both been told through sources was interested but looking elsewhere at potential head coaching gigs. But exactly what Tom mentioned, sometimes you got to look at your guys. And if your guys make sense and you want them to go get an opportunity that they deserve, promote from within and maintain the momentum that you've got going so far. Yeah, and, and if you look at the coaching trees that these guys have come through, it is – a, very Oklahoma, and B, very offensive-oriented and just, like, productive offensive minds that they've been through. I mean, you go, you look at Seth Luttrell's career. I mean, obviously, he played at Oklahoma. You know, he coached under Mike Leach, coached under Mark Mangino. 
you know, coached under Larry Fedora at UNC. Um, you know, it's just been under a lot of these very, you know, Kevin Wilson, another one, of course. Mm. Um, <clears throat> Joe John Finley has been, obviously worked with Jeff Levy the last two years, worked with him at Ole Miss. You know, he's been around Josh Heupel. He's been around Jimbo Fisher, who was a great offense coordinator before he became a head coach and got so involved with everything else. But, I mean, you look at the track records of these guys that they've been around, and it just makes sense. I, again, it, it's a logical hire. Um, <clears throat> you know, for, for, for Joe John, it's, you know, his first opportunity to have that co-coordinator title. He, you know, the only other time he had that was, you know, he was at Ole Miss. He had the passing game coordinator, which isn't quite the same, but, you know, he's going to be a little bit more involved offensively. And if he wants to keep going up the ladder, like Colin said, you know, promoting from within, being able to kind of build your status and earn your keep. I mean, this is the next step for him because, you know, I don't think it's out of the question to think that if Seth Luttrell goes and has a couple successful years here, as a lot of people assume, that he's going to get another head coaching opportunity because that's just what happens with Oklahoma offensive coordinators. They go on to become head coaches. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. And you look at that, that's a long track list of that. Going back to, you know, since Bob Suits got hired, the amount of OUOCs that have got head coaching jobs, very high number. And I agree with everything you guys are saying. I think that sometimes the obvious move is obvious for a reason. Um, promoting Seth, it's a combination of both the safest move and also I think just the best move. I mean, as far as you look at the reaction of obviously the guys that we talk about on Sunday, Colin, that, you know, you got to keep Jackson Arnold. What he seems to approve the higher, these other QB commits that are waiting in the wings, these other skill position guys, the fact that you're able to keep the staff together behind Seth, um, because you go bring in an outside guy and obviously we'll use Sean Lewis. Cause that was the big buzz, you know, name and people were excited about that possibility. And not that that wouldn't have been a great hire, because it would have been. But if you bring him in, there's a lot of risk there in terms of, okay, Jackson Arnold, how does he feel about it? How do these other recruits feel about it? Is he going to want to bring his own coaches in? How's that going to have the ripple effect recruiting-wise outside of that? So I think it's a combination of things. Seth knows what he's doing. He's a good coach, a good offensive mind. You look at his success with previous quarterbacks. Obviously, we talk about Mason Fine. Go back to his at Arizona, Nick Foles, stuff like that. And then you pair that with the fact that he's just also the safest move. He's a really good move that's also safe. That's hard to beat, if you're asking me. So I think the combination, I approve completely. And then, yeah, people get hung up on the co-OCs thing, wishing that they had just named an offensive coordinator and not do the co-OCs thing. That's not uncommon. People have, I mean, it got in their head a little bit. They don't like it. Oklahoma themselves have done it many times. Kevin mm -hmm. was a co-OC with Chuck Long, I do believe. Josh Heupel was a co-OC. So Brent Venables with Bob Stoops at Oklahoma – this is not out of the norm at all. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, Seth's going to call plays. He's going to mainly be running the show. And so I don't see any issue there at all. So, Colin, I want to get your thoughts in your input now as far as the staff behind him. We talked about it a lot on Sunday, <laughs> keeping the staff in place as best you can afterward to reduce the you know recruiting impact and things like that. You reported to our VIP subscribers that there were conversations. Jeff Levy was interested in maybe getting DeMarco Murray to jump. You know, certainly there was a lot of thought that Joe John Finley was a big can to jump at one point. Maybe even Bo Beatonbo, Jeff Levy had that conversation. What went into it from your what you're hearing and your thoughts on keeping all these guys in place behind Seth Luttrell to make sure that that continuity stays the same and that Oklahoma can feel good about where everything kind of sits moving into obviously the bowl game and then beyond obviously into next year and things like that. So to tie what we're talking about into what we're about to get into. I think this is another layer that people forget. First off, you mentioned the co-OCs thing. Titles don't really mean a damn thing anymore in college football. Let's yeah. go ahead and put that out there. It's glorified ways to get somebody a raise, mm -hmm. and they deserve it. But because <clears throat> of that, go ahead, Tom. I see. You uh, I was going to say, and the, the, and the important distinction that Oklahoma put out when they announced the move is that Seth is the OC, Joe John's getting the co-title. So, like. Seth, Seth is the guy running the show. He's oh. going to be calling the plays. It's a bump in title. It's a bump in money for Joe John. He's going to be more involved in the game plan. But at the end of the day, this is going to be Seth's offense, and he's going to be calling the show. And at the end of the day, too, because of that note, Brent Venables, one thing that he needed was a head coach of the offense. We know how involved Brent Venables is. Kind of the inverse of the current trend. He is heavily involved with the defensive game planning can be seen calling plays on Saturday. And we knew going into this search immediately, he wanted someone who could run the show on the opposite side of the ball, someone he could trust. And I think you mentioned the, the, the staff continuity, Josh. This is another thing that I had to keep in mind when I was 
digging up things on on various outlets of who could be involved in this. Oklahoma, another reason why you go hire these two, how many top-tier offensive coordinators are you going to look in the eye and say you can't hire an offensive line coach? You can't hire a wide receivers coach. Right. You can't hire a running backs coach. I mean, it simple state of fact, even if discussions had really dove into things between someone like a Sean Lewis or a Brennan Marion, I find it really hard to believe that a lot of top tier candidates would have seriously considered the position, given the fact that the staff continuity is really important to Brent. And I think it's important to everybody. Oklahoma fans wanted to make sure these staffers are still in town because of what they've helped build to this point going into the SEC and with these two hires, that gets that done. Now, Bill Beanbow, I always felt like he was going to be a Norman, but it, as I wrote a couple times as soon as Illustrated, any head coach worth a damn is going to make somebody say no. And with this move, they now have a lot of people in that building telling others no. Whereas an uncertain future leads to more phone calls taken if you're starting to interview guys outside the building and so for me i look at this move look it, i have it on good authority that demarco murray was a candidate for jeff levy to be a coordinator on his staff to keep that guy in house especially when you're set to bring in the number one running back in america and you've got a lot of returning production of the position it's huge you got to keep bill being bow around you got to keep emmett jones around and i think with joe john Seth Luttrell is going to run the show, but this allows him to put in even further effort and expand his horizons and eventually contribute in a greater way because he's also someone like Tom mentioned who has learned from a number of different places. And so I just think at the end of it all, it wasn't only a situation where let's get these two guys taken care of because it helps us. Taking care of those two helps out everybody else because now everyone feels a lot better about their career trajectory and how settled in they can be. And Norman, so that's why to this point, like I reported, I really only expect three staffers at this moment yeah. to be heading out to Mississippi State. I put out that Matt Holacek, who was sort of the assistant quarterbacks at Oklahoma, an offensive analyst, he's headed off to Mississippi State. Pete Thamel later later confirmed that report. I'm led to believe that a deal is basically finalized for Phil Lodeholt, which to me checks out. Phil wants to continue to expand his career. There are a couple of different offensive line analysts at Oklahoma. And so with the salary pool that Jeff Levy was given for his assistance at Mississippi State, I could see where Phil Lodehold gets a raise and maybe gets more uh, involvement in a game plan. And then I think Benton Doobie, there's still progression being made there to my knowledge, but the, the current belief is that he will be in Starkville with that staff at least by February, probably mm -hmm. earlier. And so, Look, losing those three guys potentially still hurts guys, but, I mean, across the board, if you're able to maintain this staff, which I believe is full of really talented individuals, that, that's huge for you as you go into one of the biggest unforeseen transitions in program history, making that move into the SEC. Yeah, and, and it's not a surprise that Jeff Levy's, you know, taking some of these behind-the-scenes guys with him. You know, you look at Matt Holacek and Phil Odell, they were with him at Ole Miss, too. Like, it makes sense for him to bring them along and keep bringing them up and build out his own coaching tree. Um, but, I mean, to be able to keep the on-field staff particularly intact, that's that's huge for this team. I, again, like, especially just the timing and kind of just this nexus point that we're at with Oklahoma going to the SEC, to be able to keep that offensive staff together and have a semblance of continuity going into this new phase, it, it, it's it's huge. 100%. I think the biggest uh, thing will be the intimidation factor, not having a big fill on the sidelines anymore. Um, biggest guy out there, even even in his post-playing career. Um, but yeah, he moves on. It just makes sense for those guys to continue to advance their careers and uh, things like that. And the important part was keeping the position staffers in place, like we said. And obviously the recruiting side of things, Colin, obviously only one D commit so far. Uh, Dozy, as you call up, might be even coincidental on the timing. You can uh, elaborate more than on that than I could. Do you expect it to be more the status quo after that? And we talked about it on Sunday that even before this hire was made, felt really good about Jackson Arnold staying put. Felt pretty good about the other quarterbacks waiting in the wings. Obviously, Michael Hawkins, Kevin Sperry, Brendan Zerbrook, all of them staying put. 
And then outside of that, it was going to probably largely depend on what position coaches stay. But for the most part, it seemed like they were in good shape to not really have too big of an impact here, despite Jeff Levin moving on. Then you bring up Seth Luttrell. How do you kind of uh, forecast that for fans that are still kind of maybe, I don't know if worried is the right word, but, you know, kind of like, are are we going to be okay here to keep everybody that we have, all these shiny toys, all these receivers, Devon Mitchell, these quarterbacks? Do you sense that, for the most part, the recruiting class is going to stay pretty much intact uh, with signing day here coming up here in a couple of weeks? I really don't expect very many more casualties, if you want to call it that. And to be honest with you, you, you touched on it. The Doziezu Kanma decommitment, in my opinion, was something that had been brewing in the works now for about a month or two. Maybe even beyond that, I had heard rumors even going into a couple weeks ago that Doziezu Kanma might be a candidate to go explore other options. And TCU sounds like the early front runner there, which makes a lot of sense. But outside of that, I really do not foresee a lot of other guys looking elsewhere because what reason would there be? Now, I do think what gets lost are two things. Jeff Levy is an elite recruiter. People don't know how personable and how talented he is when pursuing a prospect. And then number two, Jeff was incredibly meaningful to Oklahoma's NIL efforts and making sure things were taken Mm -hmm. care of for those recruits on that front. But there are voices in that building who coincidentally, because of these moves, are sticking around who can take care of that and take on that workload. And so outside of that, like, I'll just be honest. Maybe a name or two I was keeping an eye on was like KJ Daniels, the slot receiver type out in the state of Louisiana. You don't typically pull out of Louisiana all that much. He felt like somebody given his skill set who could make sense as a late push for other programs. From what I've heard, Emmett Jones has made sure that's taken care of. And then from there, I mean, Joe John Finley gets promoted. So Devon Mitchell, arguably one of the biggest chess pieces in all of this, you know for a fact he's sticking around (laughs) and arguably now going to be one of the biggest parts of next year's offense, which is what he wanted to see. And as we all know, after seeing Devon in person a couple times, the guy's going to play. So you had to have him around. Outside of that, man, again, I, I don't see a lot of turnover, not only in the recruiting space, but transfer wise, Jackson Arnold's basically made it known publicly, he's sticking in Norman. And look, OU was going to get into some sort of roster turnover given the fact that the transition to the SEC is looming. Because at this point, you have to be doing whatever it takes to better the roster ahead of that move. But outside of your typical run-of-the-mill portal casualties, I think because of everything that we've discussed at this point, Oklahoma fans can rest easy knowing that a, a typical coaching change isn't going to produce the results that are likely going to be seen in Norman, given how much continuity was struck. Definitely seems like Oklahoma handled it well. Um, from somebody who was, you know, obviously around covering this team with the head coaching search and the, the circus of that, this was very quick. Not that offensive coordinator is the same as head coach, not saying it is, but this was very quick. Jeff Levy was gone on Sunday. They announced these hires yesterday, right, Wednesday. We were, and we were reporting it on Tuesday night. Like, it was very quick. They looked at some candidates. They said, you know what, our best candidate is right here. We already have them. Let's promote. And bing, bang, boom. We're here just a few days later from us doing the emergency reaction show, and they, they've made the hires official. So, I think Oklahoma handled this really well. The ripple effects seem to be minimized. And if you're a Sooner fan, I think you have to feel pretty good about things. I'm excited to see Seth Luttrell have his, his fingerprints on this. Obviously, Colin, you covered him back at North Texas. Just, I guess, here on the way out as we, as we wrap up this uh, this portion of the program, just what can Oklahoma fans expect uh, from, from a Seth Luttrell offense? It seems like they're going to – he's a tough guy. You know, listening to some of his former teammates talk about him and things like that, it feels like Oklahoma is going to be anything but soft offensively um, coming up here under Seth. And I'm excited to see what it looks like. What can you and OU fans kind of expect to see – from the Seth Luttrell offense. I don't imagine they're going to be going lightning fast anymore. Um, is that probably going away? What do you kind of think that it'll look like now moving forward, Jackson Arnold, this offense now and uh, the SEC with Seth at the helm? Yeah, so for those who don't know, I, as a young journalist out of school, just looking <laughs> to get my hands on whatever work possible, right? Helped with Mean Green 24-7, our UNT side, believe it or not, on the 24-7 Sports Network. And 
Part of that was because I believed that covering someone with Oklahoma ties and Seth Luttrell would be something I could handle well. And I always said watching Seth and his program management and his offensive approach, and I know Tom's got a feature he's working on, and we're working on a couple different things at Sooners Illustrated that I think are going to be really cool. But I always said when I was watching him in Denton, like, this is if the air raid was given to a fullback and you're just like, <laughs> figure out what you want to do next. And I really like his approach. Now, given the fact that he did work with a couple of different offensive coordinators and guys who were a little bit different, i.e. Graham Harrell, former Texas Tech quarterback, many name will know. He had his handprints on Seth Luttrell's offense for a little while as his OC. Mike Blesh, who's now at Cal, who was a very talented coach in his own right. He was an offensive line coach kind of guy. So it was it was a little bit different than the days of Graham Harrell. But to me, I think everyone will talk about Mason Fine, right? The quarterback who became a star under Seth Luttrell's guidance. And, and for any of those who are doubting what Seth Luttrell can do with a quarterback as the new quarterback's coach at OU, may I point you in the direction of Nick Foles, Mitch Trubisky, and then Mason Fine. Yeah. But to me, guys. I look at this and I say a couple different things, and I noted this on the board. One thing I thought Seth did really well is he gets the guys the ball. When that defense knows who's really good, and keep in mind, it's the G5 level. There's only so many dudes who are going to really hurt you. So all that defensive att attention shifts to those dudes. The way he handled Jeff Wilson at running back, Jalen Darden as a wide receiver, even guys like Jalen Guyton, who's now had a product productive career in the NFL, I thought Seth was really good at just figuring out a way to get his guy the ball, even when everyone knew the ball was going that direction. I think another thing, too, obviously there's like a mix of, of zone and gap scheme, so throwing a little RPO. But the air raid concepts are going to be very prevalent. I believe that Seth wants to run a north and south-based offense. He wants to attack vertically. He wants to run downhill. And the last thing I think I'll note here. I think Seth Luttrell in this offense is going to highlight the tight end H-back position far more than OU fans have been used to seeing, maybe even dating back to like the Dimitri Flower days and maybe even like Mark Andrews, because I would encourage folks to not only research guys like Jalen Darden and Jeff Wilson and some of the other stars at UNT, two names, Varkis Gums, a guy I, I covered for a long time, covered him in the transfer portal, I believe Varkis set the UNT freshman tight end record and receiving yards at 630 plus or something to that effect. So immediately he's getting good young tight ends the ball. Jake Roberts is another. A Norman North product, if you'll remember correctly. Jake Roberts went to UNT, became a highly productive tight end H back type. Yeah. And eventually transferred to Baylor. And then even someone like Jason Pertle, who was a walk on. What Seth does really well is he'll line his tight ends up in a two-point, a three-point, or even in the slot. And so for someone like Devon Mitchell, that opens up a lot of possibilities. I'm really excited for Seth. Obviously, again, I covered him, and I we used to talk kind of off the record just about OU football and how he reads all these OU articles and things that nature. It's going to be really cool to see him not only call this offense in front of OU fans, but maybe add a little extra umph as an alumni now calling the shot. Yeah, I was going to say just add on to that. I mean, obviously, Colin, Colin's seen it up close a little bit more. But, you know, again, you look at who he came up under. It's a lot of air raid roots. Um, I know when he when he really kind of got his hands on the offense more at North Texas those last few years when he got more offensively involved, he incorporated more beer and shoot concepts there. So that's very similar to what Oklahoma has been running under Jeff Levy. Um, you know, I think it's going to be more passing to set up the run. But like Colin said, vertical passing, downhill running, um, you know, he's his teams have been very effective. Two of his last three seasons, they were top 20 nationally in yards per carry. You know, he led Conference USA in rushing uh, in 2020 and 2021 at four of the seven highest scoring offenses in North Texas history. So his offenses produce. Um, I'm, re I'm really curious to see how it goes. You know, he, he said in that statement yesterday that, you know, it's going to look a lot like what he was doing those last few years at North Texas. You know, he's gonna, not going to change too much at Oklahoma, but he's going to add his own flavors to that offense. So, I, like like Colin said, I think it's something for that fans should be pretty excited about. 
Yeah, if he can do what he did with Mason Fine, this five foot eleven kid from Locust Grove High School in Oklahoma, and the numbers he put up, who's still playing, by the way, in the Canadian Football League, if he can do that with what he did with him and transfer that over to Jackson Arnold with the skilled players Oklahoma's going to have next year, which, by the way, they're losing very close to none of their skilled players. Drake Stoops moving on. Not to diminish that, it's going to be a tough guy to replace, but everyone else in that receiver room is slotted to be back. Um, you know, obviously have the big guns. You're bringing in Devon Mitchell. The running back room is loaded with Taylor Tatum coming in. The skill positions are are in a great place. What a way to start if you're Seth Luttrell, first year at Oklahoma. You got a talent everywhere. Jackson Arnold, the quarterback. It's going to be fun to watch. I'm excited to see what it looks like. And we get a chance in a few weeks to an extent in the bowl. I mean, I'm sure he's not going to be able to change a ton in a few weeks, obviously, but he'll get a he'll get a go at it in, in uh, presumably San Antonio. We'll see what bowl they end up, and that'll be kind of fun. And not only do we get a little glimpse of this, guys, but a, a little teaser for the pod. Monday transfer portal window opens up. Maybe Seth Luttrell adds a few more toys mm -hmm. to play with in the offense. We'll get into more of that later. But I, I believe this is an offense that's going to sell itself to guys who have played a high level of ball. Absolutely. All right. Well, I appreciate you, CK. Thanks, as always. It's been a great uh, week. and a bit busy week for you. The OC search, you've been absolutely all over it. And look forward to talking to you more as obviously the transfer portal opens up. And signing day looms. Lots of stuff coming up. So get some rest if you can for a moment. And uh, we'll catch up with you next week. Uh, we're going to bring James D. Jackson into the program now. Hit some other news and notes uh, for Oklahoma here as we head into the weekend in this first weekend of December. All right, we now welcome in. James B. Jackson to the program, joins Tom and I. Hit a few other things here on the way out. So, obviously, no Big 12 championship game this week uh, for Oklahoma. They were they were so close, so close. BYU very tried. close. They tried very hard to send Oklahoma to Arlington, but they couldn't quite get it done. Oklahoma State hangs on. It'll be an all-orange Big 12 title game, and thus Oklahoma now turns their attention to the bowl season. What's next? It looks like it's going to be the Alamo Bowl, which is a little disappointing, obviously, when you were thinking, like, you know, Six, seven weeks ago, real big. I had some Rose Bowl hopes and things like that. That dashed quickly. Guys, the main thing here, though, is that the the reason that New Year's Six is looking far-fetched at the moment is that Oklahoma is 12 in the penultimate rankings. The final ones will come oh out gosh. on Thursday. Um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. There's a few teams that are blocking them of getting up to that New Year's Six line, namely Missouri, Penn State, Ole Miss, that team's 9, 10, 11. So Oklahoma is not looking in good shape for New Year's Six. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. It looks like it's probably going to be Alamo Bowl. But it just makes no sense. What are you guys at in terms of the CFP rankings? Because, yeah, obviously Oklahoma is not in the playoff chase. So the natural inclination is, what do you care about the rankings? What does it matter? Well, it matters because Oklahoma is getting jobbed kind of right now out of a New Year's Six game. What's your guys kind of read on the situation here in terms of the Sooners look like they're going to get left out? And uh, it's kind of not really – Correct, if you ask me. What do you guys feel about it? Yeah, the thing that's interesting is Oklahoma clearly has the best win of any of the two lost teams. Like they beat Texas, right? Right. Like none of those other like, uh, what is it? Penn State's best win is Iowa, which Iowa. yes, Iowa is playing for the Big Ten championship this week, but they're also ranked 16th, I believe. <clears throat> um, and their two losses are to Michigan and Ohio State. But I think what's happening is that the, instead of value, like putting an emphasis on Oklahoma's best win, they're weighing more Oklahoma's worst loss against it. And to be fair, I think Oklahoma probably has the worst loss of the two uh, two loss teams. You know, they, they lost to Kansas on the road by you know one score. You know, the the loss to Oklahoma State again by one score, but Oklahoma State ranked eighteenth playing for the Big 12 championship. That one's a little bit more understandable. It's the Kansas one right now because Kansas is unranked that it makes it a little not look great on your resume. Um, you'll get, again, you look at Penn State's two losses to top six teams in Ohio State and Michigan. Um, who else is that? Ole Miss. You know, they lost to Alabama yeah. and Georgia. You know, two teams that are fighting for a playoff spot right now and will be playing again this weekend in the SEC championship. And Missouri's losses, again, Georgia and I believe was it LSU or Missouri no. losses? They lost to Georgia? you said Georgia. Yeah, they lost to Georgia. Yeah, they did lose to Georgia. And the other loss, trying to work quickly here. 
moving fast. The other loss is where is it? <laughs> LSU, yeah, LSU. LSU, yeah. So <laughs> and LSU is ranked right behind Oklahoma at thirteenth, I believe. So I mean, they all have two very respectable losses. So I think the committee's putting a little bit extra weight on the fact that Oklahoma lost to a team that is unranked mm-hmm. in the rankings right now. Um, but I, I just I, I have trouble scoring that when Oklahoma has far and away the best win out of any of those two lost teams. Yeah, and I think I think also I mean when you look at those two losses too, I mean. Oklahoma was missing Danny Stessman for a majority of the first one and, and all of the second one, too. And I think a lot of people yeah. miss that, especially when they look at the loss that Oklahoma has. But there's, there's a case, I think, that maybe they're doing this to hurt Texas as well. Because I know you, you see, you look at Texas where they're at right now. If everybody wins their conference championship games the, the way they're supposed to, for, Texas doesn't even get in, which is, which is crazy because I know Josh talked about it before the season. We, we were saying if Oklahoma was, you know, had one loss, and, got, and won their, in the conference championship, there's no way they wouldn't get into the playoff because a one-loss Oklahoma is going to get into the playoff. It's crazy that the situation now is the same thing for Texas. So maybe yeah. they're doing that. They're setting the precedent that now that we're going off of the worst loss, and, and because they Oklahoma's Texas' worst loss, they're bringing Oklahoma back, which would ultimately pull Texas back as well. I don't know. That's just something I'm throwing out there. It's just it's just a weird situation because – James loves conspiracy theories. <laughs> I don't know if it's a conspiracy because I, I made it up on the spot. I mean, it's just like when you really sit and think about it, man, it's like that's 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 pretty – it's kind of strange that you're going to have this situation, right? I mean, Texas getting not getting in if they win the, championship, the conference championship, they're not going to get in. It's, I mean, crazy, I, don't, right? I don't think it's strange because, like, you can't just take everything in a vacuum. Like, everything requires context, and obviously nobody really expected the Pac-12 to be as good as it was this year, especially at the top with, you know, Oregon and Washington, the way they've played. And, you know, th- that game came down to the final play their first time around, the, the playing again this weekend for a spot in the playoff. Um, you know, I think everybody expected whoever wins the SEC is probably going to get in there. Um, certainly if Georgia's undefeated, they're going to remain number one. <clears throat> Alabama will be an interesting case, you know, can the playoff leave an SEC a one loss SEC champion out? Like, I mean, they, they theoretically they can, but they haven't before. Yeah. Um, you know, how much does Florida State get penalized? Like, even if they finish undefeated, but they look ugly against Louisville without Jordan Travis because you know they struggled against Florida to put them away for a while there. Um, you know, they said they haven't dinged them for that yet, but you know the ACC has been really weak. You know, out of all the conferences, you know, the ACC is probably the weakest. And the Big 12 has probably been second right behind them um, if you're ranking the Power Fives. So it, it, it's just a very weird scenario because I don't think anybody, you know, we, we all probably thought that there would be some other teams stumbling. Like Washington looked very shaky for, you know, pretty much the last month or so of the season. And they're very fortunate to still be undefeated at this point. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, if, like you said, if you told us at the beginning of the season that a one-loss Big 12 champion might get left out of the playoff, we would have thought it was crazy, taking crazy pills. And but the way the season played out, it could happen. Just, yeah. Mm-hmm. Why are we valuing losses over wins? You know, that that's what, mm-hmm. to me, um, when it comes to, you know, the Oklahoma-Penn State on this kind of Missouri thing. Missouri did play Georgia tough, and, you know, so I, I – I, I think Missouri is the best two the one that's the most egregious yeah. um, because Penn State just does not have really much to hand their hat on at all because it's not like those Ohio State and Michigan games were overly competitive either. They were pretty decisive. I know the scores aren't that lopsided, but if you watch that Michigan game, you know that it was it was now classing. Um, and that was in Happy Valley, too. They did beat Iowa. <laughs> had no offense at all, obviously. And that's their best win. But Oklahoma's best win is obviously a team that's right in the thick of things, um, a team that has probably the best win in the country, maybe Texas going into Tuscaloosa and beating Alabama way back in September. So, you know, and, and frankly, obviously, yeah, Oklahoma wants their six bowl. But if this was a year later, this was the difference of Oklahoma make the playoff and not when we go to the 12 team. Because as it stands right now, Oklahoma would not make the 12 team playoff because that last spot would get taken up by the highest G5, which would be too late. <clears throat> this instance yep. so it's a big deal now but it would be an even huger deal if this was a year from now and it just kind of reinforces that my personal faith in the college football playoff committee which has always been pretty low should continue to get more <laughs> because it just they, these, these things make no sense to me and you listen to the interview that they do with you know the cfp chair on the on the ranking show on tuesday mm-hmm. it's, it's mm-hmm. mind-numbing it just makes it's just word vomit it just makes no sense 
And it, that's kind of what we're getting right now because the argument for Ole Miss and Penn State in particular is really the big one to be ahead of Oklahoma. It's just not there. And it's costing Oklahoma a spot in a New Year's Six game right now. Yeah, like you you look at Penn State's schedule. Who's their second best win right now? Is oh, it West Virginia? Bad. Northwestern? Maybe? Yeah, it's either Northwestern or West Virginia. And that's not saying a lot. Like I know Oklahoma West Virginia. destroyed, by the way. West Virginia. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like I know West Virginia kind of, you know, outplayed expectations from the preseason because they were picked to finish last in the Big Twelve. But if that's the second best win on your resume, it's not great. I will say this for Oklahoma, though. There, there's still that outside chance that the committee reevaluates things with this last set of rankings after the conference championship games. And I think the big game that we all need to be paying attention to is not any of the Power Five ones. It's the American. Because you have Tulane playing yep. SMU. And SMU has looked really good this season. And Oklahoma beat them in week two. You know, we, we said back then that, hey, this is probably going to end up being one of the better wins on Oklahoma's schedule just because we thought that SMU was going to be a pretty good team. SMU currently not ranked. Tol- or Tulane, I believe, is 22nd, 23rd in the rankings. They're up, yeah, they're in the 20s, yeah. But if SMU wins the, the conference championship and gets into the rankings, that is another win over a ranked opponent on Oklahoma's schedule. That is something that the committee will have to – take into further consideration and put a little more weight on to. And also if it's an, if it's a big enough win that, you know, for some reason it drops Tulane out of the top 25, you're taking a ranked win away from Ole Miss too. Yeah. And that change, that cha- that changes the math. The unfortunate I'm not for Oklahoma I'm not fans, Preston Stone is out for SMU. Yeah. Or, yeah, heard the quarterback there who obviously played against Oklahoma played all year, got banged up in there, went over Navy, he's going to miss uh the game this weekend and, and whatever bowl they have. That's the kind of a tough wrinkle there. Go ahead, James. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the boat that if OU, OU would beat any of these two lost teams anyway. So like, cause you still think that OU, you know, if they, if they play their, at their, you know, at their best, they're going to beat those teams because they should be, you know, in that, you know, top six conversation if they had taken care of business the way they're supposed to this year. So I still think even if they, even if they don't get in, maybe you put them in the Alabama bowl, get some one of those other two, two lost teams and you can let them play it out on the field because I do think Oklahoma could beat those teams for sure. It'll be Arizona is the most likely. Yeah, um, I know, but I'm, yeah. it, and that, that's the way. That's the team nobody wants to see right now. <laughs> no, uh, not at all, because Arizona is the best nine and three team of all time. Um, they're throttling everybody the last yeah. few weeks, pretty much since they lost that USC game. Real close, USC went like that, and Arizona went like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And so that's not a team you really want to play right now. So that that's the way it's looking. Obviously, we'll talk about that more next week when it's official. It's too bad, you know. We thought. Certainly, we're thinking real big, and it feels like Oklahoma is had a season worthy of a New Year's Six game, but just because of a group of people deciding, they're they're probably not going to get in. But we'll see. Like Tom said, they have one more weekend to change it. You know, all these teams don't play. Maybe they – who knows? They just willy-nilly – they've done it weird stuff before. Maybe they'll do it uh, again this weekend. We'll find out what bowl Oklahoma is in officially on Sunday and where we're headed uh, late next month. Other news and notes. So far, only one transfer portal enter for Oklahoma. There will be more. That's just the way it goes. But only one so far. It's DJ Graham, who uh, is kind of the forgotten man on the roster. Uh, I do want to mention that real quick, that he's in the portal, moving on, look for somewhere else. We'll say we never have a chance this year because he's been hurt all year, so you guys haven't really had the opportunity. But one of the best guys to talk to, very smart, very uh, personable, has been a really fun player, had some really nice moments as a cornerback, a defensive back. Back in the Alex Grinch, obviously, and uh, defense and Lincoln Riley regime, obviously the interception against Nebraska, which is still replayed all the time. One of, the, most one of the greatest of all time. Gus Johnson the passed away in the booth <laughs> after he caught that. Last year, he made the move defense to offense in the middle of the year, which is obviously very hard to do. Um, he decided he wanted to play offense instead. Brent Venable said his heart was just on offense. They move him over. As you would guess, didn't really have an impact the rest of the year after that, making the move in like literally October last year. And then this year he's been out all season with injury. Now he looks for a new team. Um, obviously, guys, this is a guy that just kind of got lost in the shuffle. He was one of those X-factor guys that we talked about back in like fall campus. Like he obviously can catch. You know, he's very smart. He's athletic. Maybe he could have a chance, but then he was banged up and was out the whole year. Now you look to see, you know, what kind of mark he has and where he winds up. And hopefully he's healthy wherever he ends up and has a chance to – Make an impact on offense. 
Yeah, I don't think this this move for him is any, you know ill will towards Oklahoma. It's just getting a better opportunity for himself in the situation. Because so many receivers. You, yeah, I mean, Josh, you've been listening. I mean, you've been talking about it since second half of the season about how good this group of wide receivers that are coming in, how good they are as of right now. I mean, it'd just be tough to get a spot in that rotation, you know, enough to where you could, you know, really show your skills because you only get you're going to get a little bit of a little bit of time out there. If that was the case. So it's just him wanting to get a better opportunity for himself. That's what I that's what I would assume from this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> again, just a guy who you know couldn't really, yeah. you know, couldn't stay healthy this year. Obviously, that impacted him. And changing positions is never easy, um, especially when it's you know from defense to offense. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, he's got the talent, he, he's got hands, um, you know, hopefully he can find somewhere to, you know, have an opportunity to flourish and show what he can do, um, whichever side of the ball that ends up being on. Um, but obviously a guy from Texas. So, you know, those schools are always looking for guys to come home and, you know, help through the transfer portal. Does you know USC reach out to him since he's got that pre-existing relationship with you know Lincoln Riley and stuff like that? Even though Alex Grinch is gone, who knows? Don't don't want to really speculate on where he might end up, but I'm sure he's going to get his opportunity because he is a talented player. Even though he wasn't able to, you know, do you know, yeah, become something on offense after making that move. Mm-hmm. And like I said, there will be more portals in due time. The portal opens next week officially. Uh, be sure to keep up with us. Oklahoma 247sports.com will let you know whenever those guys become official. And obviously, Colin's been all over the VIP side of it and the intel as far as where Oklahoma is looking to add in the portal. So that, that craziness is coming up very, very soon. So stick with us here going to next week. Wrapping up the show here with some hoops on the way out. We'll start with the good men's team, Porter Moser. The top 25. For the first time under Porter, they are in the top 25 uh, at right at that 25 spot. On Monday, they got that after they went to San Diego and won the Rady's Children's Invitational. <coughs> knocked off Iowa, and then they beat USC at the buzzer. Otega Owa tipping in there. Um, they're playing really well. And we talked about it, you know, obviously at the beginning of the year. At the very least, they seem like they're going to be more watchable, and they're going to have a chance to hang with some of these more athletic teams. Obviously, so far, so good. 6-0, and you're in the top 25. There's a long way to go. A lot of big games still to be played. I kind of was just perusing their Big 12 schedule a little bit yesterday. I did not realize that BYU was in the top 20 now, in the top 25. The conference is just disgustingly deep. There's so many good teams. So they'll have more chance to prove themselves, even just next week, some big non-conference games. But so far, uh, obviously, Tom, you and I will be at McCaslin Fieldhouse tonight. So far, so good. I mean, they've passed every test. I mean, it's early, but you have to be excited if you're an Oklahoma fan about the way the team is looking and playing, their depth. A lot to like, frankly, so far in the first month. Yeah, and, you know, we we really didn't learn too much those first four games just because the caliber of the opponent wasn't great. I mean, you expected them just to, like, look competent. Like like, like we talked about, they've been playing a more aesthetically pleasing brand of basketball. They're more up-tempo. They're more athletic. They're pushing the pace a little bit more. The real question was going to come in San Diego because, you know, they played a quality Iowa team and a ranked USC team. And they passed both those tests. They beat Iowa by a dozen points. Um, controlled it, yeah. Yeah, con- controlled that game wire to wire. The USC game was obviously a lot tougher, um, you know, probably a little bit more talented team, you know, that roster that USC has constructed there. But they gutted that one out. And, you know, there were questions like, oh, how is this team going to respond when a game gets tight down the stretch? And they answered the call, and Otega Owe deserves all the flowers for, you know, being there at the right spot at the right time and getting that tip in. Um, you know, JVM McCollum got a pretty good look right before the buzzer, too. Um, you know, a bunch of us were kind of huddled in the, the red yeah. room at the stadium watching the final possession of that game because we had just wrapped up football interviews. So it, it was cool to see, see them kind of persevere through there. And, look – the important thing is for them, those two wins more than anything are resume builders. Those are both quad one wins on their NCAA tournament resume. Those are going to come in handy down the stretch. You know, before last night's games, you know, I think only one team in the country had more quad one wins than Oklahoma does right now. I think they were tied with two other teams at two and zero, but I think it was Marquette has three of them already. So it's a good start. You know, it's going to be a step back down in competition tonight with Arkansas Pine Bluff, which is one of the 10 worst teams in the country, according to Ken Palm right now. Um, So they should handle their business, but they're off to their best start since that final four run with Trey Young. They're 
Buddy you know, Hill. Ranked, what? Buddy Hill. Final four. Buddy Hill. Sorry. Um, ranked for the first time. They're making mistakes like that, Tom. They'll come after you. I, I, I've been sick all week, man. Cut me, cut me some slack. <laughs> but they're they're ranked for the first time under Porter Moser. You know, it's been you know nearly three calendar years since they've been in the top twenty-five. So they're feeling good. Um, they just got to keep continuing to you know see how this thing plays out, finding their identity. Which you know, like they've said, you know, you've seen the shirts that they wear. DCO defense creates offense. Mm. They're, they're they're really priding themselves on that and just being able to push the pace and get up court a lot faster and. It, it, it's paid out dividends for them so far. I mean, we're getting to a point to where, I mean, we might even have to have all three of us out there for the men's because if they keep winning like they are. It's going to be a lot more interest in this, in this basketball team. I mean, they've been surging this season. I mean, we, you, you talked about it, Josh, yeah. before the season. I mean, they're ranked like, what, 10th out of 14 in the Big 12? Is that where 12th. they were at? 12th. 12th. I mean, yeah, it's even worse than I thought. They were 12th. I mean, they're, they're you know, they're exceeding expectations as of right now, you know, the way they've been playing. So, I mean, just it's been looking good, really, really good for them. So looking really good. Yeah. So far, so good. It, yeah. I was gonna say, and again, it's early. Yeah, you know, they yeah. only had real two, two, two tests so far, and you know, the good thing is that they were able to do that on a neutral court. You know, win away from home. Um, that 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 says a lot about them. And you know, more questions will get answered. You know, starting next week when they get Providence and then they get Arkansas up in Tulsa, and yeah. then you know, before you know it, it'll be Big Twelve season and. That's when the real crime begins because that schedule is unforgiving. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. I'm excited to see them play more and more good teams, especially like we said. The McCaslin game tonight will be cool um, as far as the setting of it and everything. But then next week, yeah, Providence comes to Norman on Tuesday night and then Arkansas in Tulsa next Saturday. That's back-to-back tough games. Arkansas just beat Duke last night. They got they got dudes. North Carolina in Charlotte coming up in a few weeks as well. So we're going to continue to learn more about this team. But at the very least right now, it seems like this is a team that is capable of playing at a high level against good teams. So it's exciting. Exciting start. Um, wrapping up here just on the back end, the women, obviously, great start to their year, 5-0. and Did not – they basically had the inverse of the men's week, a couple of tough losses in that tournament out there. I think it was in Fort Myers. Also, Princeton, they lost to a Tennessee team that's really good. It was a close game. So they've tumbled out of the top 25. Obviously, James, it's it's very early for them, too. They got off to a great start. They kind of did the opposite of the men in some ways. They got to this, this good start that was a little respected. They got some nice wins. And now a couple losses that, they, you know, especially the Princeton one was not, you know, that kind of came out of nowhere. Like, whoa, what, what happened here? Now they'll try to get back on track. They're back at home tomorrow. But no reason to really smash the panic button or anything, a couple of losses. But maybe a little bit of a a heat check for lack of a better word of kind of, they got this great start. They, they're still replacing a lot of pieces from last year. So it might be a yeah. little more in progress than we kind of wanted to make it out to be, you know, at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, you, you look at who they lost to as well. I mean, we, we knew Princeton was a good team anyway, before the rankings came out just on, on Sunday that you knew they were a really good team. Now, when you look at it now, Oklahoma has two losses, and they're both to ranked teams. I mean, Tennessee is ranked 19, and, and Princeton is now in the top 25 as well. Yeah. And so yeah. you look at that, and you're thinking, okay, o Oklahoma just needs – they're like one week away from getting back in. They just need a one good a week, and they're, they're back in the top 25 because they have two quality losses. I mean, it sounded bad at first when you think of Princeton. You think, you know, not a team that should be, you know, beating Oklahoma in basketball, but – I mean, that's a really good team, and we and we, we knew that at the, at the time as well. And so it's just getting those kinks ready because even against Tennessee, oh, you had the lead. They I mean, they were up. They just had a little – they just had a slow uh, ending to the game, and that's why they lost mm -hmm. that game. So they, they, they proved they can play with those teams. So that's why you say, okay, just one week and they'll be back in the top 25. That's that's where it's at right now because, you know, Peyton Verhulst has been has been the, the one for this team. She's been the, the ultimate transfer that came in out of Louisville and just been outstanding for them. She's been leading the way for them. And then Skylar Vaughn coming in, you know, coming off the, not off the bench anymore, but being that starter that that's, that's there for them. And they've just been playing really well. So as long as they keep those, keep all of them together. I mean, Sahara Williams as well, a freshman that's been breaking some numbers for OU as a freshman, just keep them together. Stay, stay, stay to what you've been doing and they'll be just fine. I think. 100%. So, and they're back at home tomorrow night. I think they got grambling coming in tomorrow night at the LNC. Mm -hmm. So we'll keep an eye on see how they bounce back in that one. All right, that's it. We appreciate you so much for tuning in. As always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, leave a review wherever you're watching or listening to the program. Oklahoma.247sports.com, soonersillustrated.com. They both take you to the same place. Head over there, become a VIP subscriber. It's a great time to do it. Transfer portal season, like we said, is starting to kick up. 
And uh, wild times are ahead, and we got a lot to talk about and a lot to do over the next month as we finish out 2023 and turn the page to 2024. That's it. We'll be back next Monday talking about all the latest for Oklahoma and the portal, whatever their football news, basketball recaps, all that good stuff. We'll see you guys then. For Tom Green, James D. Jackson, Colin Kennedy earlier. I'm Josh Calloway. We'll see you guys Monday for the next edition of the Sooners Illustrated podcast. See you.